All right, this is the book of Acts, lesson number five. Lesson number five. We're keeping up with it that way. We'll be in Acts chapter number two tonight. Here for the next few minutes. We uh, completed Acts chapter one last week. As I've said every, just about every time, this is not a verse by verse, even though it appears to be that way here at the beginning. And we're doing it that way on purpose. But once we get over into the book of Acts, we can, once we get these first chapters uh, down, then we can survey the rest of it. Uh, we'll be in Acts chapter number 2. Now let me say this. In Acts chapter number 2, more false doctrine has come from Acts chapter number 2 than just about any other place in the Bible. And so it's very important to let's get this down and uh, get it down real good. Now let me give you an outline real quick, something just a uh, few preachers and maybe some of you ladies teach at Sunday school class, something like that. You might think this is interesting. Uh, but in Acts chapter number 1, someone goes up. That's the Lord. Acts chapter number 2, somebody comes down. Anybody want to take a guess? Holy Spirit comes down. Acts chapter number 3, somebody goes out. And they go out and start spreading the word. And uh, so that's a good little outline. Uh, if you're interested in that. Now, here in Acts chapter number 2, um, before I go there, you've got two lines here. We drew it last week. And some of you have uh, uh, drawn it in your notebook. This top line is the way uh, all of these Old Testament prophets, even Peter and all of the, the 12 apostles, about right here, right after the cross, this is the way they saw the thing on this top line. Um, they did not see. Now, do you notice, do you see this? How this right here, just take your hand, push that over, and this here, the church, the body, and the rapture is inserted. You see that? This church, the body of Christ. And when I say church, I'm not talking about Holy Hills Baptist Church. I'm not talking about the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, or whatever. I'm talking about the body of Christ, where all the saved are uh, put in to when they get saved. Uh, the church which is His body is what I'm referring to. It was a mystery hidden from ages. Um, the first person that got this mystery, you might want to take a wild guess. The Apostle Paul got this mystery. The Apostle Paul wasn't saved until Acts chapter number 9. We're in Acts chapter number 2. So when Peter, when we're reading Acts chapter number 2, remember I said this last week? Sometimes we have the problem of we know too much. We've got the whole Bible. We know about this. But when you go to Acts chapter number 2, they didn't know about this. And so when we're reading Acts chapter number 2, you watch this top line and see everything that Peter says. Uh, everything that Peter says. Here he is. Let's draw Peter. I don't know if it looked like Peter. Now you watch in Acts 2 while we're reading. Everything, just about everything he says is pointing to that same thing. Now you watch through what we're saying. All right. Uh, let's look at uh, Acts chapter number 2. Now you may want to write this down in your notes. We've referred to it, but I want to say it again. In the Old Testament, the Jews rejected God the Father. At the cross, the Jews rejected God the Son. And at the day of Pentecost, they rejected God the Holy Spirit. Now, in Luke 24, when they're, when they're crucifying the Lord on the cross of Calvary, in Luke 24, Jesus prays a prayer. And He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God the Father grants that prayer and gives them another opportunity to receive the kingdom message in Acts chapter number 2. And that's what we're fixing to read about. It's a kingdom message presented to the nation of Israel. 
Now, Acts chapter number 2. Uh, let's look at verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And let me stop and say this, Acts chapter number 2, the day of Pentecost. It is a Jewish holiday. It is 50 days, Penta, 50, uh, 50 days after Passover. 50 days, Jesus dies on Passover. He uh, walks with them, what, 40 days, is that right? After his resurrection, seen of them 40 days, he ascends. So in chapter number one, you know he dies. He's dead for three days. He walks with them after his resurrection, 40. So that's how many days? 40, three days. So in Acts chapter number one, uh, uh, 43 days he ascends, uh, roughly. And then a week later, which is 50 days, on the 50th day, the Pentecost, is where they, all of these Jews would gather together and they're coming to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the, the, the uh, day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost will be found in Leviticus 23, uh, the feast day. <clears throat> Let me give you this. What they would do, they'd take that wheat and they'd beat it out and they would grind it together and make two loaves of bread. These two loaves of bread had leaven in it. Two loaves of bread, all one. Yes, they're sinners, but they are forgiven. Jew, Gentile, in the same body. Ain't that all? That's what they do. Those two loaves, and it'd be a wave offering to the Lord. And they would push all that together and make two loaves out of that thing on the day of Pentecost. Jew and Gentile in the same body. Jews are sinners. We're sinners, but guess what? We are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're in the same body together. Uh, whether uh, it be Jew, Gentile, bond or free, it makes no difference. We're in the body of Christ. But Peter... He didn't see this. He was looking at each other. All right. Day of Pentecost fully come. They were all in one accord, one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as, circle that word as in your Bible, if you write your Bible, if you don't, as a rushing mighty wind. You say, why is that important? Well, it's fixing to be in just a second. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, watch in verse number 30. Here's a misconception. People have this idea in Acts chapter number 2, fire was falling from heaven. Let me help you. Fire did not fall from heaven. On the day of Pentecost. Right. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it's little similes uh, that's the as and alike. Now, if I told you and that I'm going to jump off this building, the roof of this building, everybody would gather out here to find out what was going to happen. And I would jump off this building, you would say, Brother Jeremy fell off this building like a rock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did I turn into a rock? before I hit the ground? No, I fell like one. When it says cloven tongues light as fire, fire didn't fall from heaven. It was like fire. Now, if you want to know the definition of cloven, uh, Deuteronomy, look at Deuteronomy real quick. This is something I was telling you about. You don't need a, a, a Greek or a Hebrew teacher. You just need King James Bible. Amen. Deuteronomy 14. The best thing to do is go to another place where the same word is used and see if it won't give you a definition. Deuteronomy 14. Verse 
Verse number 7. This is given dietary laws. Dietary laws. Verse 7. I'm breaking in the context just for time's sake. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that chew the cud. Uh, anybody know what chews a cud? A cow. He chews a cud. Or of them that divide the what? Cloven hoof as a what? As a camel. Everybody, everybody, anybody ever seen a camel's hoof? What is it? Split. What's the definition of cloven? Split. Anybody ever seen a snake's tongue? Split on the end? Cloven tongues light as a fire. Anybody ever been around a campfire and you saw that them sparks split off like that and just you understand what I'm saying? It's the best I can do with it, I, you know. But I'm just telling you, fire did not fall from heaven on the day of Pentecost. Now, let me stop right there. Let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Hold your place in Acts 2, Matthew 3. Now I'm taking my time in Acts 2 because so much false doctrine comes out of Acts 2. You wouldn't believe it. <coughs> Matthew 3. Verse number, well look at verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye for the king... i gotta be, I got to use my hands. Is that alright? Wait, i got to draw John the Baptist. John the Baptist is over here, right? right. Okay, John the Baptist is over here. And him and Peter look a whole lot alike. <laughs> They preach the same message, so they ought to look sort of alike. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Peter preaches what? What was his message? Repent ye for the what? Kingdom. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Guess what? John the Baptist didn't see this either. If you'd have told John the Baptist that there's going to be a church, a body of Christ, where the Jews and Gentiles are all in the same body, and they'll be raptured out sometime, he'd have, he'd have stripped a clutch, he'd have had a stroke, and three connection fits right there, right before the cross. Because in John's eyes, salvation was of the Jews. He didn't know about this either. Why didn't he know about it? Well, Paul, he was first revealed to Paul. Paul ain't saved yet. John the Baptist, repent you, the kingdom of heaven is in hand. Now, let's go to verse 11. Find out what's associated with this kingdom. You want to know what's associated with this kingdom? Watch this. Verse 11, John talking, I indeed baptize you with what? Water unto what? Repentance. Water baptism of repentance is associated with that kingdom gospel. But he that cometh after me, take a guess, Jesus Christ, he is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with what? And with? All right. Now, have y'all ever heard them, them fellows on TV? Uh, Sometimes I'll be flipping through there and watching. Just, just, just look. And uh, I saw one one time. He got up and he said, Y'all that want the baptism of fire, y'all come on up here. A bunch of people got out of their seat and come down the front. They want the baptism of fire. And I said, Man, ain't this something? This is going to be good. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's supposed to kill half his congregation in just a second. And he, you know, does his thing, prays over whatever, and supposedly they, they were. And then this is where they get that. And they will compare Matthew 3.11 with Acts 2. Jesus is going to baptize you with fire. Acts 2, cloven tongues of fire came down. Anybody remember what word I just left out? Acts 2, cloven tongues of fire came down. You see how easy it is to trick people? They'll associate Matthew 11, or, or 3.11 
that Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And this is what they'll tell you. In Acts 2, the Holy Ghost came down and the fire came down with it. And if you want to get it, come down here and get it. And to show evidence of it, you'll speak in tongues and we'll know that you got it. Oh. Ain't that good. <laughs> All right, you ready? We don't, we don't, we're not going to go to the, uh, the, the Greek or the Hebrew. We're just going to keep reading. Let's keep reading verse 12. He go, Jesus Christ is coming. He's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Whose fan is in, in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with what? Unquenchable fire. Y'all ready for this? Malachi chapter 4 says our God is a consuming fire. Now watch this. If you'll get saved, Jesus Christ will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He'll put you in the body. If you don't get saved, He will baptize you in fire one day. The baptism of fire is not a good thing. <laughs> it's not something you would pray for and it's surely not something you would come down the altar to get Amen. we've already had that at our old, at our old building on Reynolds <laughs> we had the baptism of fire come down and <laughs> we missed it hallelujah we missed it you understand I'm trying to make it comical but I want you to see it Jesus Christ, if you get saved, you'll baptize with the Holy Ghost. And if you don't get saved, there are people. Definition of baptism. Okay? A baptism. I just baptized that marker in my pocket. Is there any water up here? Get it? Uh, immersion. Do you know people that get that they're not going to get saved? They die without Jesus Christ are going to be immersed in the flames of heaven. Amen. That is the baptism of fire. Amen. And you don't want it. Right. No matter what the television says. Always go with your Bible before the television. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. We've already de defined those words, cloven and like as a fire. We've already uh, got that. Verse number four, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, if you don't understand that verse, keep reading until you do. Verse five, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem what? Circle Jews. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why were all of these Jews coming from every nation under heaven? Did you not? Man, the day of Pentecost is a big day. It's like Christmas to us. For them, it was a big day. It's a holiday. I mean, it's a big day. Everybody goes to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And all of these Jews were coming from miles around. They spoke all kind of languages. I mean, they were just all over the place. Coming to this one particular place, Jerusalem, because of this particular feast day. Verse 6. Now when this was Noah's abroad, what was Noah's abroad? Well, these men, these, I'll go ahead and tell you, the twelve apostles were the ones that spoke in tongues. Now when this was Noah's abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Why were they confounded? Because that every man heard them speak in his own gibberish. <laughs> you see how easy it is to trick people? 
That's why you always need the Bible laid in front of you because you don't want little cre creature to drink it. They don't do that. I have one. They'll do it. Look at it. Now, I try to do it on purpose. It'll just get you to. Heard them speak in his own what? All right? Let's define our Bible. We don't, you, nobody's got a Greek or lexicon or Hebrew, whatever. So let's look. Verse 4 says, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues. They were speaking with other tongues. Wonder what that was. I wonder if it was just gibberish and just a bunch of hocus pocus and a bunch of. Well, no, because it defines it down here. What was them guys speaking? They heard them speak in their own language. Well, what were the tongues? Languages. A national language, or a, not a, a nation's language. All of these people come from everywhere. They're coming to Jerusalem. They're coming from all nations around the world. They all don't speak the same thing. And on the day of Pentecost, they're, they're all uh, running around. People go, hey, y'all come here, these 12 guys over here, man. Just pick, pick whatever one you want to listen to, man. Whatever one you understand, you hear it. It's just, it's amazing. They all gather around, and one of these 12 is speaking what they know. And they're like, really? Ain't that something? They understood what they were saying because he was speaking their language. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. It's just that plain and simple. It's not you come down the altar and we'll pray for you until you get the Holy Ghost. And when you get it, you're going to start just going in a, in a, in a, in a start raving fit. And you're going to start talking and crazy. Why would you talk crazy? All of us speak English here. I mean, most of us speak a little hillbilly every now and then. But I mean, other than that. You understand? Everybody at this particular in Jerusalem wasn't speaking the same language. That's why they had to have tongues. Right. Yeah. right. right. We all speak English here. Yeah. I, I don't mean to yell at y'all. I'm just getting <laughs> seven. Verse 7, ready? And they were all amazed. Well, I would have been too. And marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? I didn't know them Galileans knew our language. And how hear we every man, notice every man, every man, y'all underline every man, heard every man. Yeah. Woman's not allowed to speak in tongues in church, according to 1 Corinthians 14. Right. Y'all don't believe it, do you? I ain't got time to go to 1 Corinthians 14, read it when you get home. But they're not permitted to speak in tongues in church, and the majority, that's all it does, speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. And how hear we every man in our own what? Wherein we were born. Now if you didn't, if you didn't get, if you didn't get verse 6. You ought, to get, you ought to get verse 8. I mean, I was born, I was taught to speak English. Yeah, right. If I went somewhere else, went to France, and somebody was over there and he was preaching on the street, and he was preaching in English, I'm like, I don't understand him, but he looks like a Frenchman. I didn't, I didn't know he knew English. Yeah, right. He's speaking the tongue I was born in. Right. right. Okay. All right, here we go. Verse 9. I'm just trying to get, make sure I know how to say this. <laughs> Parthenians and the Medes and the Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya uh, about uh, serene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Creeks and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Mm -hmm. 
we are hearing them preach the wonderful works of God and we can understand them men because they're speaking the language I was born in. Now, brings me to our mouth that I've passed out. <clears throat> Those of you listening by home or watching it on, on the DVD, make sure that we mailed you one of these or you get one of these. Now, this is hard. It's, you'll have to look. Dad, did we f figure out are there six? Somebody count how many nationalities right here? 16, 16. All right, 16 nationalities right here that we just read. There should be 16 numbers on this thing. All right, everybody find Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, uh, if anybody can see my finger, Jerusalem down there in the lower right above number five all right look way over here at number 13 Rome Italy everybody see the boot <coughs> there were people that traveled from Rome Italy Jews all the way look all the way here's a scale if you want to measure see how many miles that is if you want to measure that out one time sometime when you're home Rome, Italy, all the way over here to Jerusalem. Why? Day of Pentecost. This fellow over here wasn't speaking the same thing that them Galileans was speaking. God came down upon them. Now, I have seen this researched out. I cannot prove it. I'm just going to tell you, I've got the research here if you want a copy of it. But out of 16 nationalities, when you add them all up together, out of those 16, some of them spoke the same language, same dialect. You work it down, and there were 12 languages spoken on the day of Pentecost. How many apostles? Twelve apostles, 12 languages for 12 different nationalities or Actually, 16, but a couple, like I said, a couple of them spoke the same language, and you got 12 different languages being spoken, and 12 different apostles, each one of them speaking that language to them people. They understood. You say, why are you saying that? Because what you see on television is not what happened on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we haven't done anything to our Bible. We haven't went anywhere else. We just read the Bible. And anybody that will read the Bible ought to be able to see that. Now, let's continue. Verse number 12. Well, let me stop and say this before we go to verse 12. Uh, write, write this down and remember it. There is no such thing if that's proper, amen. There is no such thing as an unknown tongue. Anytime in the Bible where tongues are spoken, somebody knew the language. It may be unknown to the speaker or the hearer, but one of the two persons knew the language. No such thing as an unknown heavenly language. No such thing. Homework? Find me one. In the Bible. If you want if you if you just, you know, find find an unknown language in the Bible that nobody knows. It's a heavenly language that nobody knows about. It just comes upon you and you just there you go, and nobody can interpret it because it's come from heaven. I've heard all of it. And what you do with that right there, you say, give me chapter and verse for that. Oh, it's in there. Oh, it's in there. Well, well give me chapter and verse. Well, I'll have, to, I'll have to go ask my preacher. He's the one who told me. All right. Now let's go to verse 12. They were all amazed. And we're in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Verse 13, Others mocking, 
notice the word mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. Now, uh, anybody want to know what new wine is? Same thing. Let's go to Isaiah 65. Hold your place in Acts 2. Isaiah 65, and let's find out what new wine is. All you need is a Bible. Isaiah 65. <clears throat> I'm just only going to give you this one because that's, that's all we got time for. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Breaking into context. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the water. Cluster. Cluster of what? What's new wine? Well, cut off my legs and cut me short. <laughs> Right? Back to Acts 2, 13. All you have to do is go to the pl another place where that particular phrase is found and it'll nine times out of ten give you the definition somewhere. These other folks are looking around going, you know, this is amazing. I mean, it's nine o'clock in the morning and these guys are speaking all these different kind of languages. I mean, these men must be full of new wine. Now, This is a sarcastic statement. You with me? It's a sarcastic statement. It would be like myself, Dad, Brother Charles, Brother John back there. We're all standing up here. And we all start, all you, you people speak French, you people speak Spanish, you people, uh, whatever y'all speak. We're up here speaking to y'all. And y'all think we're, we're you know, being over drunk. And y'all look up here and go, them boys are full of sweet tea, ain't they? <laughs> hmm. You know, in other words, these people mocking going, ah, yeah. And preachers, yeah, they're full of grape juice. Yeah, right. You with me? All right, verse 14. But Peter, I told you, Peter is the apostle to who? Jews. The Jews. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. There's one of your memory verses. Um, Apostle Paul being, or excuse me, Peter being the, uh, to the circumcision, the Jews. Paul being to the uncircumcision, the Gentiles. But Peter, standing up with the what? Amen. Lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of who? You see that? This, this, is, a Jewish, this is a Jewish passage. This is a Jewish chapter. And all ye that dwell at work. Well, ain't that something? Be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now, isn't it odd? Isn't it odd that 90% of false doctrine comes out of a Jewish passage that wasn't even written to us? Now, we read it. We get application from it. We learn from it. But when you open the mail, you figure out what goes to who, and you this where Peter is telling us who the mail's going to. All right, he's getting ready. He's, he's we're getting ready to lay a sermon out. Now, all those preachers have different ways of doing stuff of how we lay a sermon out. But let me give you this outline real quick of Peter's sermon. Peter's sermon starts in verse 16 and goes all the way down to about verse 38. That's Peter's sermon. Not that long. But it's a good Jewish sermon. All right. Verse 16 through 24. Peter appeals to the signs. Everybody got that down. 16 through 24, Peter appeals to the signs. In other words, he talks about resurrection, the signs. 
Who requires a sign? Jews. Verse 25 through 31. Peter appeals to the scripture. He quotes the psalmist David. And so that's where he uses his uh, that's where he uses text or some of his text from. And uh, verse 32 through 36, Peter appeals to the senses. In other words, witnesses. He brings witnesses to corroborate his message. In verse 37 and 38 is the appeal. In other words, the invitation. When we give an invitation, we're appealing people to come. That's the conclusion of the message. The invitation. Now, when you get done writing, we'll read the sermon. And talk about it. Acts chapter 2, verse number 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, the margin, if you want to write this, Joel chapter 2. It's easy to remember because we're reading Acts 2. Well, Peter's fixing to preach from Joel 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. Remember I just told you the first part of the message. Appeals to the signs. Verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Now I want to stop there and break that down for you. He is prophesying in Joel chapter number 2 where the Spirit is going to be poured, poured out upon all flesh. Write this down remember it. The prophecy of Joel 2 did not happen in Acts 2. Right. What you saw was just a little of it fall. You didn't see the full, the whole thing being fulfilled in Acts 2. It wasn't. Now, you see that top line? There's John the Baptist, but look here at Peter. He's pointing over here. See him coming? See the second? Now, does everybody know the difference in why I draw the second coming when the, the line goes all the way down the earth and the rapture, the lines meet in the middle? Does anybody know the difference? The rapture, we're going up to meet the Lord in the air. Second coming. Actually, this is the way we see it. Satan coming, he's coming down to this earth and stand foot on the Mount of Olives. Well, Peter didn't see this part. He's looking over here. All right? Where the second coming is going to happen. Watch this. Uh, look at verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and noble day of the Lord come. Now, when he's preaching, he's pointing this way. Everybody with me? He's pointing this way. He's a preacher. Prove it. All right. Matthew 24. Hold your place. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. You remember the wording that we just read in Acts 2? Let me read it to you. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and noble day of the Lord come. Matthew 24. Verse 
Y'all look down here a minute. Y'all see this seven year tribulation right here? What comes after seven year tribulation? Right after tribulation comes what? Okay. Verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Is everybody there? Immediately after the what? What comes after tribulation? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be what? Did we just read that in Acts 4, 2? And the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign... i got to talk to my mouth again. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And, and, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. Well, it basically figures it. Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, what do you suppose Acts chapter number 2 is referring to? Second coming. All right, I don't think I don't think you. All right, I don't know if you got that yet or not. Revelation, look at Revelation six. Acts two, Peter's preaching. He said the sun not going to be dark. The moon won't give her light. It's going to be turned into blood. On that great day, that noble day when the Lord comes. Revelation 6, <clears throat> verse 12. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became what? And sat off the hair, and the moon became as what? The stars of heaven fell on the earth. Even as fig tree cast their untimely figs when she is shaken with a mighty wind. We just read that in Matthew 24, where the stars fall. Second coming. Verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Referring to second coming. So Peter. Not preaching rapture. He's preaching same kind. Why? To a bunch of Jews who require a sign. We just said over there in Revelation or Matthew 24, a sign, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. That'll be a sign. Alright, back to Acts chapter number two. We got a few more minutes. Let's look at verse 21. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Anybody ever wondered what the definition of saved is? Wonder what it means. Does it mean saved in a car wreck? Uh, saved from a boat accident? Saved from persecution? Saved from all kinds of stuff, you see. All right? Y'all want to know what the word saved means, okay? Look at Joel 2. It may take you a minute to find it. Right after Hosea, ain't it? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, somewhere over there. Joel chapter 2. I'll give you a minute to find it because I want you to look at this. It's maybe all we have time to look at. 
Joel chapter 2. I want you to look at verse number 30. It'll almost be like we're reading the book of Acts. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. Is everybody there? And I will show wonders in heavens and the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. Y'all remember reading that in Acts 2? Verse 31, the sun shall be turned what? We read that in Acts 2, didn't we? And the moon into blood. We read that in Acts 2. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be what? Let me ask you a question. What's the definition of saved? What's the definition to be delivered? Ain't the Bible an amazing book? Mm-hmm. It's an amazing book. Now, let me say this. I got about four minutes. Let me say this. When Peter is standing right here, he's looking back. Jesus just ascended. In their mind, they thought he could come back just any minute. They thought, well, okay, let's stand here a minute and look. He'll be back. I mean, he said he'll be back. And they're just standing there. That's why the two other guys show up and go, why y'all stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus is coming back just as you've seen him go. He didn't tell him how long he was. Oh, it's been 2,000 years. They're still... They probably died looking like that. The point being is, they're looking for him to come. What was he going to do? He was going to deliver them from Rome's bondage. So when we look at Joel 2, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered from this Roman bondage. These, these Romans have us under Caesar. We don't like being under Caesar. We want a king. We want a kingdom. And we want our guy, our Messiah, the one that we know that's supposed to be sitting on the throne beside Caesar. We're going to throw Caesar off and we're going to put Jesus Christ on the throne right here. He's going to deliver us from this Roman Empire. You get the message. In Acts 2, watch, this is a good closing point. In Acts 2, they, now, please, just listen to what I'm saying and don't, don't let it disturb you too bad. In Acts 2, they wasn't, they wasn't looking for somebody to deliver them from their sins. Amen. Yeah. Even though Jesus just died for them, yeah. right. they don't know it yet. They don't understand. People, I've heard people say, well, Peter was looking back over here to the cross. No, he wasn't looking back at the cross. He was looking yonder way. And they did not realize that the man that just died, yes, he was their Messiah. But he died for, to, to be their Savior. And Paul tells them that later. Uh, and so here, here we go. Um, I guess that's the best stopping point I can come up with. Uh, to be delivered. That's what they were looking for. Now, when we're right here, anytime Paul, the Paul line lines up, we, we can use it. Watch what I'm saying. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter number 10, verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Saved. Shall be delivered. How were you delivered? You were delivered from your sin. Yeah. You were delivered from the bondage of Satan. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But at this particular time, they were looking for a different kind of deliverance. Question, comment? Go ahead.